Crossroads Media. If you don't have enough balls to play in these type of games, rest doesn't do us any good. <laughs> Man, when I tell you I've listened to John Tortorella's post-game press conference 8,000 times on repeat this morning, I stand by that. Now, what I think is happening is I am in so much pain and I am in so much discomfort that I am trying to get through this any way that I possibly can. And if I find humor and real toughness in the approach by Torch, and I actually do admire and love his tactic here, that's not always the case. I will rip Torch with the best of them, but I truly love and appreciate what he did post game, and we'll play the entire presser. It was only two minutes long, so we'll do that, but. I am feeling so uncomfortable looking at the standings that I'm laughing at other things. What do they call it? Something humor? What's the word? What's the word? Where, where, where you're, it's like sarcastic. You don't actually find it funny, but you think it's funny because you're in so much pain. That's where I'm at right now with this club. Morgan Frost, with nine seconds to go in the third period against the Islanders, scores a big one, but then unfortunately, due to not being able to control the puck on his back, hand that Drysdale throws in around the slot area three on three so plenty of ice it's not as if there was five men out there and you're just throwing pizza deliveries up the middle no I mean there's plenty of room there's plenty of ice and here's the turnover just barely getting started in the overtime period and before you know it you lost another point and it's massive it's massive to get the point but it's also massive to lose the point especially when you can't beat the Montreal Canadiens you can't beat the Chicago Blackhawks. I went to the damn game against Chicago. It was the first game I went to all year. Shout out Amadeo and his father for hooking me up with a pair of tickets. It was a ton of fun. And then I'm watching them get abused. <laughs> I'm watching the Chicago Blackhawks work a power play. They suck. They don't know how to win hockey games. They're an embarrassment to the league. Yet tic-tac-toe goal behind the net. Right? Or behind the goal line, I should say, finds the net. We can't do that. And we have 10 times the talent that they have outside of Connor Bernard. Make it make sense. Fedotov was gross. Wow. Wow. I don't know how hockey becomes pressure when you deal with some of what he has dealt with in his life. If you're unfamiliar with the story, the poor guy got pretty much thrown into the military, forced to be in the Russian military, couldn't play hockey for a whole season. I don't think John Tortorella yelling at him is really going to scare him away, okay? He looked calm. He looked poised. He, he has to stop a breakaway seconds into his first NHL action. He looked comfortable. Huge. Big poised? Dude, I am stoked to see what he can become. And I'm not going to throw shade at Urson. And I saw this question come in on the Anytime Hotline text board, so I might as well answer it now. It just kind of happened organically throughout the convo. I don't despise Urson. Does he get beat clean sometimes? Yeah. Is he super sharp? No, not really. When he's on, it's really good. But yeah, I mean, he's leaking oil a little bit. But it, it's not really his job, unfortunately, to be a number one goaltender on a playoff team right now in his career. And when I say on a playoff team, I'm talking about a bubble playoff team. It's not like he's got Kucherov, Stamkos, Victor Hedman, and the rest of the crew down in Tampa Bay playing as their forward lines, and then he can't hold his end of the bargain. I mean, you got to squeeze out games because you can't score on five power plays. You got to squeeze out games because Scott Lawton is your only contributor offensively in one particular night. Or, you know, you're, you're scoring one or two goals. Like, I understand he gets beat short side or he gets beat clean, high glove, high blocker side, low blocker side. He gets beat clean a little too much for my liking. In the NHL, when you get beat some, from so far out, even though it's Austin Matthews, when Austin Matthews is scoring five steps into the 
the blue line with just a wrist shot on net and you're not even close to stopping it. You do have to provide more. But the poor kid is is doing... How do I put this? I think he's doing fine. Could it be better? Yes. Could it be worse? Yes. Yes. Put into a tough spot. I think he does more positive than negative, but you can definitely upgrade the position on where he is now. Urson would be a phenomenal backup to a Carter Hart. That's a great role for him right now in his career. But for Dodolf, I, I think I know what Urson is. I think that would be a flaw of the team in the postseason. It would be goaltending, and it would be power play. Those two would probably be what would struck this team or strike this team with the failure, the conversation talking points afterwards. The failures, what happened? Well, they couldn't score with the man advantage, and then maybe their goalie let up a couple of weak ones. For Dodolf right now, I think is worth the gamble. All right, let's see what he can be, because if he could be anything that he was last night, well, then holy hell. Seriously, I'm sort of in love just thinking about it. But yeah, I mean, you lose games to teams that you should be annihilating. It's pretty disappointing. There's some favorable matchups coming up here, and you have a little bit of time to relax because they don't play again until Friday, but it's a back-to-back, so you're playing Buffalo, you're playing Columbus. So back-to-back against Buffalo and Columbus. Please, do something, will ya? And then after that, you get another redemption opportunity against the Habs. So I swear to you, do not do anything that will piss me off. I swear to you, please, don't, don't. Because I won't be able to handle this. If they don't make the playoffs, it will be extremely disappointing. I'm going to say that again. If they don't make the playoffs, it will be extremely disappointing. I don't want to hear or I don't want to see anybody hide behind the fact that, well, they weren't supposed to be here. After 73 games of hockey, they were supposed to be here. It wasn't like they were good for 10 games. It wasn't like they were good for 7 games. They've been good for 73 games of the regular season or so. You are good. You're good. You're good enough to be third Metropolitan or first wild card team. You are good enough. After 70 plus games, there's a handful to go. If you let this slip, it will be extremely disappointing. And all of that momentum we would have felt that we were moving forward with would have been definitely hindered a tad. I mean, it just is what it is. More than a tad, it would be taken down a notch. You got to make the postseason. You have to do it. Doesn't do us any good. That's right, Torts. If you don't make the postseason, it doesn't do us any good. I think I just kind of made that work and made it make sense for my dialogue. But anyway, speaking of dialogue, I want to play the audio. It's one minute and 56 seconds. But I thought John Tortorella handled this thing perfectly. Calling his team soft, calling out players, not by name, but saying some have what it takes at this time of the year, others don't. All I know is if I was in the position and I was in that locker room and I heard my coach say these type of statements, I would be on a thousand thinking about puck drop on Friday night. Man, I would be ready to go through a fucking wall, swear to God, to prove to this motherfucker that I can do it. That would be my mentality, right? Like, this motherfucker does doesn't think I could play. This motherfucker doesn't think I could do it. And that's what Torch wants. That's what Torch is trying to get out of some of these young kids is prove to me that I'm wrong. You don't get that tactic as much these days, but Torch is calling it like it is. <laughs> he said his team played soft in the second period. He's not wrong, man. That second period against the Islanders was one of the worst second periods I've ever watched in hockey history. All right, so let's take a listen here. John Tortorello, two-minute wild and beautiful press conference. John, it seemed like after six times scores that goal early in the second period, you guys had all the momentum and things, things kind of came to a stop. What was your assessment of where things were? Sort of- Soft. One guy played, the goalie. How encouraging is it that he came in like that cold and was able to... Terrific. He's the only guy that played. Is that, is that pretty surprising? Considering you said like you trust your team, you don't have to tell them or remind them, and then they, they do that. You, you're finding things out here, okay, when these games are at a whole different plane, okay? It's still regular season, right? But it's a whole different plane. 
So we're finding things out. You talked after the last game about that was kind of what you felt like wasn't a great performance. Are you concerned at all that tonight it kind of lingered again that you just said it was a soft game per se? Uh, not the whole game and not the whole group. There are certain people that they don't have a clue how to play <laughs> or just don't have it in them to play in these type of situations. Woo! And this is why I'm glad we're playing them. I'm glad because we, we have to figure things out as far as what we're going to uh, become as a team here. That was embarrassing in the second period for the Philadelphia Flyer uniform, wow. the way we played. Embarrassing. High marks as far as how we came back in the third. Some guys. With regards to Ivan, why did you make the decision to, to bring him in and how impressed were you in his performance tonight? I, I wanted to bring him in. It just didn't look right with Earth, and I'm totally impressed. I put him in a hell of a spot. And he's the only goddamn player that played in the second period. <laughs> you made any update on Sean Couturier? No. You guys now have a couple of days off before you started back to back. Is that kind of what you were talking about over they have some guys need some rest or is that you just want? Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that to rest, this, that, the other thing. If you don't have enough balls to play in these type of games, rest doesn't do us any good. Doesn't do us any good. That's right, baby! Put the balls on the line! <laughs> we don't have any balls. Now, look, fatigue has been a topic of conversation for a few days here. I'm agreeing with Tor. I don't want to hear that you're tired. You know who else is tired? Every other fucking team. And guess what? When Tampa Bay is going to back-to-back -back Stanley Cups and this and that, they have less off-season. They party all off-season. They're not in the gym as much. Then they go right back to the playoffs and do it all over again. So my point is, if you're going to make it, if you're going to actually have sustained success, and that's what this culture is all about, is building this the right way, not skipping any steps, making sure you're going through the proper path. If, if that's true, well, you got to learn how to do it when you are playing with less gasoline. It is what it is. I don't want to hear that Sandheim... York, they're getting tired because they're playing a lot of minutes. You're in your young 20s. Yo, guess what, Cam York? When you're 30, it's not going to be any easier. When you're 29 and you're seven seasons in, it will be more draining on you because your body has taken more hits. They played more seasons. You probably had a couple more playoff runs in you. So now's the time, dude. You got to go balls to the wall. And I'm not picking on him. I'm just using that as an example because he's playing top tier minutes. You look at his time on ice. He's logging a bunch. But now Jamie Drysdale returns and, and that's huge for some of the numbers numbers back there with your top four defensemen, but it sucks because the second he returns to action, you watch Sean Couturier take a pretty massive hit into the corner and not return. It did not look good. It did not look good. So losing your top centerman, regardless of what John Tortorella thinks and where he matches him up in the lineup, fourth line center, you did actually move him up to play with better talent um, prior to this injury, but yeah, it doesn't look good, and that hurts you, uh, you know? I know Torch thinks that putting him up in the press box and giving others some time isn't that big of a deal, but it is a big deal to lose your captain. It was a tough hit, hard hit into the corner, and it's just one of those unfortunate things that happens when you play the game. I saw a bunch of people getting all pissed off and upset and angry that there were some missed calls throughout this game. A boarding call could have been called. It led to a goal. I, I didn't really think the difference in that particular game against the Islanders was they got screwed over by the referee. Nah, it's a physical game. All right, get in the corner, win your puck battles, win your damn battles, be a little bit more aggressive, stop being soft, don't have a bad second period. If you play that way in the second, then I don't want to hear you complaining about other reasons why you lost the hockey game. Because if you just perform better for 20 minutes, then, you know, I'm specifically labeling that second period here, if you played better in those 20 minutes, well, then the outcome won't be affected as much with, with a missed boarding call or a non-boarding call or anything like that. You set yourself up where that came into play because of how horrendously you fought in those 20 minutes. But I truly do love what John Tortorella did in this presser. I, I will absolutely destroy him for overtime periods, putting out garbage, putting out your least best players, your worst players that particular night, instead of going with your best players that particular night, and then the 
Flyers lose in overtime instantly. I, I hate when he does that. He's done that in the past, I'm saying. And then he sends out Rocky or sends out Shaw to speak to the media afterwards because he doesn't want to be held accountable for his decision-making. I will absolutely tee off on those decisions. But this decision right here, I love it. I love it because if you can't respond as an athlete to that we have problems. I'm 28 years old. Right? I'm not 78. And not that there's anything wrong with being 78, but I'm 28 years old. A lot of these kids in the locker room are young in their mid-20s and all. I, I'm not that far removed from the game. If you can't handle that type of... Co- if, if someone calls... That is so personal. What he did right there is so personal. Do you have what it takes to play in this league or not? Because guess what? This is just a taste of playoff hockey. We're not even there yet. This is just a competitive get-in type of competition. Wait until we're actually in it. So if you can't handle this, you can't handle the more important time of the year. If, if that doesn't get your adrenaline rolling, and if you can't respond, then I might have to question your DNA. I love what John Tortorella did last night in that press conference, and it will tell us a lot about this team. If they come out flat on Friday, I'm going to be sick to my stomach. So it's funny, whenever I tweet something ripping John Tortorella, not liking what he does, a lot of my comments afterwards is something along the lines of, it's great, this is what it's all about. And then if I praise John Tortorella, now my comments are flooded with the people that despise him. The sooner he is gone, the better off we are. That's the first comment here. Here's the second comment. It is so tiring with him. He makes questionable coaching decisions time after time and is never accountable and constantly does stuff like this, which doesn't resonate with the modern player. Well, you got to remember that there is an age disparity with some of these guys. Sean Couturier, Travis Konechny, I believe Owen Tip, Sanheim. Like, there are guys that are in range of mid-20s, and then there are your 30-year-olds, there's your Scott Lawtons, there's your Cam Atkinsons, uh, and, and I don't think Nick Sealer is shying away from any of these talking points by any means, so I don't know if that's necessarily true, and I love it, man, I just, I love it, I'm sorry, I love it, I love, there are some serious questions and serious concerns right now about this team, you get a spark at goalie, I think everybody's willing to fight for this dude, he looked so big, man, he looked looked so good, so poised in the net. I can't stress that enough. He was tested very early, never shaky. And I heard him speak post game as well. Like he's not a kid. <laughs> he's not a kid. He's a pro. He looked like a pro. He looked like a goalie that's played a ton of hockey, that's been in a lot of big moments. I know the KHL isn't the NHL. It's Essentially, the second best league in the world, though. I mean, it is, right? NHL, you got the KHL, you got the Swedish Elite League. There's top leagues all around this entire planet. And the KHL, it's a, it's, it's a insanely, insanely high up there. This guy's a pro. He looked like a real pro. So you get that spark of, whoa, hold on a second. And this isn't your backup goalie spark. Because normally you get that backup goalie spark where we got to do more because we're worried that we don't have our top-notch guy. This is, this guy elevates us to a different level. We got to make sure that we elevate ourselves so then what he brings to the table is worth it, right? He's doing something extra. He's doing something great. He could push us over the step. We have to do our job to make sure that we don't let that slide. Let's take advantage of him coming here and being excellent. And by the way, shout out to Danny Briere and Keith Jones for making this thing happen. I'm sure you've seen a bunch of different reporters or a bunch of different Twitter fan accounts just really running through what Danny Briere and Keith Jones have to, had to experience so far throughout their early stages of the tenure, whether it's Cutter Gauthier, whether it's Carter Hart, um, whether it's getting guys into the Voorhees facility and sneaking them through. This doesn't just happen overnight. Getting Fed- uh, Fedotov here, sorry, I always want to say Fedotov, and maybe I, I did and that slipped at some point, but Fedotov, getting him in here and sneaking him through and it being sort of quiet, th- this takes time 
team to develop, and they knocked it out of the park, no doubt about it. Speaking of the Cutter Gauthier thing, not that I really want to spend more time on him, but apparently Eric Lindros recently made some comments about how the Flyers handled things wrong, and they should have just approached it with the mindset of, we love Jamie Drysdale, and we just really wanted to acquire him and not throw Cutter Gauthier under the bus. Well, here's the foolish thing about that, Eric. E, if you will. Jamie Drysdale is nowhere close, and I like Drysdale, to the ceiling of Cutter Gauthier. That would then be telling the public, we're bad at our jobs, that we are undervaluing Cutter Gauthier and how good he is, that we want a lesser player. We'll take uh, the, 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 the Jamie Drysdale for a Cutter Gauthier. They're not on the same playing field. They're not on the same playing field at all. And then they're just like, hey, we suck at our jobs. Thanks, guys. Hey, I, I want you guys to believe in me. I want you guys to believe in us so much. That means you don't appreciate the communication and the openness of front office to fan base when this entire franchise has been down the thick of it and in awful spots for a while now that you get a fresh new regime and they pretty much stated that we will be open and we're going to let you know what is going on. And they do that, and now we're knocking it. No, no, no. They did it right. This kid screwed over the city, and you have to be held accountable when you make dumb decisions. When you say certain things. He needs to be held accountable and realize that what he did was wrong. Because if not, then he can go do whatever he wants. And he doesn't deserve death threats and Twitter DMs. I'm not talking about that. That's irrational, horrible people. But anyway, Flyers handle things right. That's the truth of it all. I don't want to hear they're tired. I don't want to hear that they're getting back to reality. No, their reality is they're a damn good hockey team. And they proved that to us for a long time this season. So I'm not letting them get off the hook here. That's foolish to me. Let's take a phone call here from our guy, Sean, who wants to chime in on this team. Another tough loss last night for the Flyers. Another loss that you just really can't have at this point in the season. They haven't had a murderer's row of a schedule lately and haven't been able to take advantage of it. Kudos to Fedotov. I think he should have started that game. But, you know, that's not my decision to make. But... To me, it just looks like this team, the wheels are starting to fall off the wagon. And you hear Tortorella's comments after the game. It's obvious to me, maybe, you know, I'm sure he wants to make the playoffs this year, but he's looking ahead to next year. And he basically now has an idea of who he's keeping moving forward and what guys he's leaving behind. And that list will be given to Briere, and those players will be out of here. Some of them may shock people at the end of the day, but this is, again, a growth period for this team. They're not ready for prime time. That's why I'm not that upset about it. I was looking forward to playoff hockey, but unless this team can get it together, I just think that ship has sailed. I don't know. I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with you. They're definitely struggling a little bit, and they're working through some uncomfortable times, but they don't die. They do go to overtime and force the— that's what they are right now. Like, you say they're not ready for prime time, and, I mean, they have some bad losses for sure, but the way they fight against the Rangers and they get scrappy, they get a point. They're doing enough to hold on where they're they're super— cl- they're not— just an abomination. They're doing enough to hang in there, which does make sense for their current form and who they are. So I don't know. I I get where you're coming from because losing to the Habs, let's see what they do coming up here. Because if they beat Columbus and they beat Buffalo and they beat the Habs coming up here and they respond to this little three-game stretch that maybe we're not loving right now, then I'll feel differently and I'll love what they did. But yeah, if they fall, this this back-to-back this weekend will tell me that. They lose both of these games and yes, they're not ready for for prime time, I don't know if I agree with this part of the phone call either, that Torts isn't necessarily worried about the postseason this year. It's more about learning about some of the guys next year. Now, I think he wants to win this. I think his approach to that pressure was all about getting into the playoffs now 
and he was using that tactic to install fear in some of these kids more so than anything else. But when you look at some of the guys on the roster for next year, this is why I don't think it's about next year. Some of them are like paling, for example. Well, he's going to be here. Deloria is going to be here. Hathaway is going to be here. They like that toughness, that grittiness, that bottom sixness. It's not going anywhere. Morgan Frost, I know he had a turnover, but he's been ascending and clearly showed a bunch of skill this season. Konechny's not going anywhere. They love Scott Lawton to death. Maybe they trade him, but that's because they were going to trade him in the offseason anyway. I don't think that would be anything due to what happens now. I think it's they're either going to trade him or not. Now, I think they're in love with him and obsessed with him, and uh, it would take five first-round picks and seven second-round picks to do it, and anything less than that, they'll tell that team to kick rocks. But if Scott, Scott Lawton goes, that's because well, it was time for him to go. He's been flirted around for trade deadlines and trade deadlines and trade deadlines. If they were going to move from him, that's because it was already sort of trending in that direction anyway. I don't think they're trading Farabee. They're not trading uh, Tyson Forster. I don't see them getting rid of Noah Cates. So they like Owen Tippett a ton. I don't think it's that. I don't think that there's many kids here that they are just going to get rid of because of some poor play down the stretch because a lot of those kids have a ton of skill and I believe has plenty of room to grow and be an answer and be a piece and 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 be someone that they grow with here. So I, I don't think that there's anyone on this team that's young. They like Cam York. They like Travis Sanheim. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I just believe he's scaring people more than anybody else. It's a tactic to try and inspire. And we'll see if they get the inspiration from the message. We'll find out. Oh, we'll find out. All right. All right, everybody. I love you guys to death. I really do. Thank you all so much. You're the greatest in the world. Let's see where this Flyers team takes us because it sure has been a journey. Love you guys. We'll be talking soon. I'll see you all on the next one.